Thank you for coming here and keeping this place warm. I'm Jeff Clark. I serve as co-president of the Board of Trustees for the Unitarian Universal Society of Amherst. Use he, him pronouns. So welcome to you, old friends, new, young, and old in the Zoom and in the sanctuary. You're a central part of our celebration today. And whether today is your first or your thousandth Sunday in our midst, we are stronger to have you here with us. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, sexualities, and genders. We're all growing, all learning, all loved. Just as you are, you are welcome here. And the board invites you to participate in the governance of our society. Um, you could talk to us at social hour, but as I see, there's no social hour today. So hold that. Um, we all have also opened the first 15 minutes of every board meeting um, for our feedback our next board meeting is on the 30th of November. Our December board meeting has been moved up to November 30th. You can also send us your thoughts at board at uusocietyamherst.org. We're grateful to be in community with you today. My name is Andrew Coat, and I serve as the Director of Religious Education here. Man, you know those mornings? <laughs> where you get to like reinstall a printer driver and your car is making a weird noise and then you trip in front of the whole congregation, spill a glass of water. <laughs> anyway, good morning. Today's service, I'm gonna talk about the shifts and the changes and the growth that have occurred within the Unitarian Universalism sorry, Unitarian Universalist kind of community of transgender religious professionals, both when it was very loosely organized and now when it is slightly less loosely organized. I've been involved with an organization called TRUST for about 10 years, and you will learn what that acronym stands for later. We're also going to have a time for spoken joys and sorrows in the service today. Today, all of the children are already downstairs working hard on our winter solstice pageant, and it is a lot quieter up here. <laughs> um, we ask that the balcony seating be reserved for those who are wearing masks, and if it helps to have a large print order of service um, or hearing assistance, we do have both of those things. You can talk to a greeter. And with that... My name is Robin Livingston. I'm a member of UUSA, and I use they, them pronouns. I call us to worship with the following words by Starhawk. I call us to worship with some of these words from Starhawk. Where's the rest of this page? We'll get half of these words this morning. No? Okay. We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been. A place half remembered and half envisioned we can only catch glimpses of from time to time. Community. Somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere, a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter. A circle of healing. A circle of friends some place where we can be free. Our chalice lighting this morning is a little different than we have been using. I invite you to say it with me. In times of light and times of darkness, may this small flame kindle what is good in us and in the world.
invite you to rise as you are able and join in our first hymn this morning, number 389, Gathered Here. The words will be on the screen and in your order of worship. Coming back from all of the perhaps chaos and confusion of a Thanksgiving holiday away or a Thanksgiving holiday that you hosted or hiding away from a Thanksgiving holiday that you were not attending, I think we could all use a couple of breaths. So. I used to have a blog. Now it was the early 2000s. Raise your hand if you have ever had a blog. <laughs> a lot of us had blogs. There was even a Unitarian Universalist bloggers network. And we had theme days and everything. So, you know, today we are all going to blog about food justice. And then people would, and you could post your links, and they'd be sent out for other people to see. It was all very exciting. I can see it on your faces right now. <laughs> However, I was a newly out trans guy, an undergrad at the time, and if having a blog was what I should be doing, it was what I was going to do. I had things to say. Now about my blog, I would like you to know that every one of my posts was brilliant and moving and very well edited. And you will have to take my word for that because that blog went to a lovely farm upstate. But I had decided in undergrad that what I wanted to do was be a minister. And you, you ministers were blogging and saying important big things on their blogs. And so if I wanted to be a minister, then I was going to have a big, important blog. There were blogs that were getting hundreds of comments a day. Cannot explain to you the weirdness of like this two-year period where everyone had a blog in the UU world. Because the thing is, I didn't actually know much about being a minister. By the time the UUs got me, what I knew about was political organizing. I first testified in front of a state house when I was 13 years old. I blatantly lied to my teacher that my mother had said this was okay. And we drove from Los Angeles up to Sacramento, which is not a short drive. We lost that vote, by the way. At 16, I was leading canvas trainings for the John Kerry campaign. I mean, you know what happened there. At 19, I was helping to run the Hancock County No-on-One campaign up in Maine, 
We are trying to become the first state to win same-sex marriage on the ballot rather than in the courts. We lost. I went to DC to lobby for sex education with Planned Parenthood and the people who'd written the OWL curriculum. As you know by the fact that we have universal comprehensive sex education right now, that one also did not work. I went to Arizona in the middle of June to campaign against the anti-immigration legislation, which, you know, and I cannot tell you how many hours I spent sitting in hearing rooms in the Massachusetts State House, listening and lobbying and answering questions about the many, many, many iterations of the Transgender Rights Bill, which we did finally win on its seventh trip through the State House. I was one of the founding members of the Trevor Project's Youth Advisory Council, and I went around the state of Maine doing suicide prevention trainings for youth. I was a section leader in the Boston Pride Parade for many, many years in a row. And at 22, I was burnt out. I had a very, very marginally useful degree, a Bachelor of Arts in Human Ecology. I was working at Starbucks and applying to seminary while unsure that this was anything even resembling a good idea. But here's the thing, every one of those campaigns you form this super tight, intimate community. Campaign time is time that is sped up. Especially for those of us who are being sent around the country as organizers, you show up at someone's house sight unseen and you are sleeping on their couch and playing with their dog. <laughs> You've been in town for three days and you know this person's life story. But as quickly as those relationships form, they disappear, especially if you've lost the campaign. <laughs> A day or two after that devastating election in Maine where we lost same-sex marriage on the ballot by a very marginal amount, we were in that little rented out strip mall building, tearing things down. The clipboards and the sign in sheets and the boxes and boxes and boxes of donuts are gone. Maybe there are a few extra coffee stains on the ground. There is somehow an unbelievable number of push pin holes in the wall. But finally, the campaign signs are recycled. The campaign colored crepe paper and confetti is picked up and tossed. The poorly functioning laptops are all packed into boxes. People return their campaign cell phone numbers. And oftentimes, you never actually talk to those people again. It's instant community and then poof, it's gone. I hated the poof. I wanted my community to stick around, or at least to have slower change. And so that is how I settled on seminary. I would keep my toe in the political world while still getting to help sustain a community around something bigger than a single issue. Maybe, maybe I would never have to run another phone canvas. That part was not true. So I did what I've always done when I'm passionate about something. I dove in absolutely head first to UU leadership. I applied to seminary 
I was a worship associate, and I was on the pastoral care team, and I was an RE teacher, and I was on the worship council, which is different, and I helped run the young adult group. I'd been there less than four weeks when they gave me a key to the building. <laughs> I started going to General Assembly as often as I could. I needed to secure funding and I was there. I slept on dorm room floors. And in that time, I started meeting the very, very few out transgender religious professionals. There weren't many. And despite us having almost nothing in common looks-wise, we were somehow very frequently mistaken for one another. <laughs> in my first year of seminary, I got an email from one of those trans religious professionals asking if I would like to get together with a small group for coffee and talk about transgender organizing within Unitarian Universalism. It was so hush-hush that this email was BCC'd and we did not know who was going to be there until we actually showed up. There were people who we knew were trans who were not ready to be outed, even in this small, small community. And so five of us met for coffee that day to hear about what had already been organized. We had a name, Trust. All right, can we go to my... So, <laughs> Trust is not an acronym, but we like to say it is. It stands for Transgender Religious Professional Unitarian Universalists Together. The P is silent, there is no S. <laughs> But we had a name, and people were really attached to this name. And so this is still the name we have. And we had a way to maybe get some funding. This was in 2013. But I want to actually read you a little bit of the official history of trust from our website. Trust was founded by Mr. Barb Grieve and Reverend Sean Parker Dennison in 2004 after several years of conversation to support and advocate for trans UU religious educators and ministers with the hope of one day expanding into an organization for all trans Unitarian Universalists. Trust has provided trainings in transgender identity to the denomination's credentialing bodies assisted in the settlement of trans religious educators and ministers in UU congregations, and working with the Unitarian Universalist Association in improving trans-related health insurance coverage and introducing gender-neutral bathrooms at its annual General Assembly. It has also sponsored informal gatherings of trans religious professionals at UU conferences, culminating in the first ever retreat for UU trans religious professionals in April of 2016. That was three people who did that. This wasn't some giant coalition. This was Sean Parker Dennison, Mr. Barb Grieve, Alex Capitan, and a few others in there too. My friend Paul, Sunshine, and me. But for a long time, that was kind of it. We had kind of a big voice for a very small number of people. And so not much happened for a bit for trans people. A lot happened denominationally. The OWL curriculum began to change. We did get those gender neutral bathrooms. But that was the work that we were doing. And then, a Facebook group. Things started to get organized. And in 2016, we had our first trust retreat in Pacific Grove, California. I was the youngest attendee, and I was 
very determined to prove how much of a real, serious, grown-up religious professional I was. I was going to be meeting new people, colleagues who I didn't even know yet who I'd been working with for years to come. I brought professional-looking notebooks and business casual clothing. And my next slide. There were 16 of us. It was not, it turns out, an exceptionally serious retreat. Also, I don't know why I didn't think of this before. I knew literally every person who was going to be in that room. Within half an hour, my friend Alex had run around the room throwing pom-poms everywhere. And I would like to encourage at the end of this uh, for you to come and take a pom-pom if you like. I am not going to throw them at you. <laughs> While none of the people were new, however, many of the stories that I heard were new to me. I heard the stories of those first trans UU ministers, their struggles to find a call. But my primary memory is of a beautiful worship that was offered by Sophia Betancourt, who now serves as the president of the UUA, though that was not her role at the time. Sophia offered a homily that morning that has stuck with me since that day. She spoke about knowing her number. Now this isn't an official count, just what people can piece together through memories and oral histories. But your number is which person in the line of your people you are to have served or attained some position. The first female ministers, the first black ministers, the first gay ministers. As a black woman, Sophia shared that her number in the line of ordaining black women within Unitarian Universalism was 16. Reverend Dr. Rosemary Bray McNatt, who was also there with us that morning and served as the president of the Star King School for the Ministry, was number two. Sophia wished us that morning a day when we did not know our number. Within the trans community, there was one openly trans person ordained by a Unitarian Universalist congregation in 1988. They never served in a religious leadership position. And number two was my friend Sean, who was the first openly transgender minister of any major denomination in the United States to serve in a, as a settled minister of a congregation, and that was 2002. A few more followed, very slowly for a long time. Our first trust retreat, like I said, had 16 people in attendance. A year later, our second retreat had around 30. But almost none of those ministers were serving as settled members, settled ministers of congregations. They were ordained, and a lot of them worked at the UUA, or they had other jobs, and they guest preached. A couple served as interim ministers, and that was about it. So a year later, our second retreat held at the strangest golf course in Florida. <laughs> Still don't know the story there. And then there was a third retreat, which continuing the confusing spaces was held at Biosphere 2 in Arizona. I didn't attend that one. Our second kid was only a few months old and it just kind of flew under my radar. And then there was a pandemic. 
We didn't meet in person for a few years, but people continued to join that trust Facebook group. We used to welcome each new member individually with a post because there weren't that many. And eventually that had to stop because we were adding so many new people. Sometime this spring, our Facebook group reached 100 members, and our listserv has around 150. We also have a few members who are not on any of our official accounts because they are not out within their families, their communities, or their congregations. So this year in San Diego, we had over 60 trans UU religious professionals at the retreat well over 100 members in that Facebook group at this point. And here's the thing. Most of the new people joining us don't know their numbers. When I took my job in Jamaica Plain as a DRE, someone told me that they'd worked it out, and I was the seventh trans person to officially serve as a DRE in one of our congregations. Of course, no one has to report on these things, so I don't hold too tight to that number. But when we gathered two weeks ago in San Diego, many of those gathered had no idea what their number would be by the time they made it to ordination or graduation or credentialing. Some who had been only recently ordained had only the vaguest idea of how many had come before them. And so we did it, right? We've hit that point where we no longer know our numbers. And we've hit the point where we no longer know every person in attendance in our gatherings. When I got to San Diego, I saw some people I knew but suddenly, I wasn't Facebook friends with every person in attendance at this conference. And while I'm happy that's true, that we no longer all know our numbers, I felt a little sad. We are growing and changing, and in the seven years since our first retreat, there's been so much change that it almost feels like I don't recognize the organization anymore. Not in a bad way, but at our first retreat, we didn't even wear name tags. And this time, it was a conference. We had name tags and there were people I didn't know and there was networking evenings. It wasn't bad, but it was strange to be in this space with these people who were my colleagues, who are my colleagues, who didn't have the same institutional knowledge. While I was there, I got back to thinking about that blog I used to have. One thing I did that I am actually proud of was I reached out and I collected prayers to and for the transgender community from religious professionals from a whole bunch of denominations. One of my favorites that was shared came from my friend Kit Wong, an Episcopal priest up in Maine. He wrote that while he first found this prayer through the Episcopal group Integrity, that it had been floating in the liturgical ether forever. I'm going to share it with you now. May you be blessed with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May you be blessed with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May you be blessed with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort and turn pain into joy. 
May you be blessed with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you may do what others claim cannot be done. So that's where I am today. Trust is growing and changing. For those who just entered the organization, this is the only trust that they have ever known. For those of us who have been around a while, there's this odd stretching that is happening. And then there are those who were around long before me. My friends Sean and Barb and Paul and Sunshine, and those ones whose names I don't know because they left our denomination due to systemic oppression and a lack of institutional support. While I was in San Diego, I volunteered to help run one of the morning worship services. And when I got to that small conference room to meet the other people who were helping out, I did not know a single one of them. At first, I was a little annoyed. I wanted to work with my friends. But it was also really great to meet these new people, to work with them in this space and hear their ideas. It was a little frustratingly disorganized, much like the service I am attempting to run this morning. <laughs> but it happened. It worked out. I used that prayer that I just read to you in that service. May I be blessed with enough foolishness to believe that I can make a difference in this world so that I may do what others claim cannot be done. We've all been working together for the last few months on this retreat. And now that it's over, we're looking at how we can go forward together as this new trust organization. It will be new by next week and next month and next summer and by the next time we meet for a retreat. This morning I offer prayer from Reverend Sunshine Jeremiah Wolf. O oh, infinite love, help me face this day. My heart weeps with fear of violence, of invisibility, of hatred. Open me to beauty and wholeness, to love and laughter. I am enough. We are enough. I live in the sacred in-between. I embody the con connectivity and allness of the infinite. May I remember, may we remember, that we are inherently sacred by our existence. The earth is filled with magnificent diversity of which we are but a small piece. May we remember that we are part of the spectacular beauty of a diverse world dependent on that diversity. My existence, your existence, our existence for its survival. When I feel lost, may I hold to the earth and to community. When I feel invisible, may I have the strength to shout joyous gratitude from the rooftops for all who have seen me. When violence is before me, I ask for grace through the next moment. When I feel connected, may I share my love with those around me. When I feel seen, may I see others in need. When I am secure, may I rise up for the security of others. O oh, infinite love, I sit with you and shine you out onto the world that we may know grace even when we do not live up to our most grounded values. We are life and we are lives worth living 
and my life and your life and our lives are lives that are valuable. Oh, infinite love, thank you for the gift of the transcendent both, all, and infinite, liminal, glue, connectivity. May I rest in that transcendent space today and for all the days to come. Our next hymn is not in your order of worship. It is number 90 in your gray hymnal, and the words will be on the screen. For From all the fret and fever of the day. ready to sing, I offer you two ways to participate. First, you can stay where you are and be held in the love of our congregation. The second is to rise in body and spirit, move to the outer aisle, and reach out to those beside you. <laughs> 